Hello again. Hello, everybody. I hope you can see us. And back from the break, I hope everybody has gotten some refreshments and um, your brains are now fit and revived for the next talk. I'm very happy to introduce to you Dr. No, or actually it's Professor No, um, Richard No from the University of Ottawa, and he will talk about burst dependent synaptic plasticity can coordinated learning in hierarchical circuits. And I'm very much looking for your, uh, forward to your talk. And yeah, without any further ado, please, Dr. No. All right, thank you, Friedemann, for uh, the invitation, for what uh, is turning out as a really nice workshop. I'm really enjoying it so far. So uh, I'm not really going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about Bob Dylan, uh, because uh, yeah, why not? Um, I, I recently looked at the Google for the lyrics of Blowing in the Wind, and it struck me that this is what I got, the Blowing the Wind by Joan Fate. So I guess this is just a silly introduction to, to say that credit assignment is hard, even for Google. Um, and I don't think I need to, to go in, long, uh, in, in a long way to explain why credit assignment in spiking neural network is, is an important problem. Um, but I, I'd like to share my view here that basically the idea of training neural networks with the algorithm of the backpropagation of error is, is really a solution to the problem in, 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 um, in a coarse grain way. Uh, but there's been kind of a schizophrenic approach to this uh, in, in history. Um, and, and I find that a little bit sad because in a way there's one really important lesson that we could take from this and it's that if neurons, real neurons, are able to represent some type of error about the representation of, of what they're doing, an error about what they're doing, then it could really help them a great deal, particularly if they could communicate that sort of representation. And I'm not sure if that's really a far-fetched idea. And that's kind of what I'd like to talk about today. Um, and in fact, Part of the, the setup of that talk is we want to, okay, ask how can we have a top-down control on the plasticity of synapses down the hierarchy? And a lot of the constraints of the biology to do a real biologically realistic version of this um, are seen as constraints, as I just said. But my talk today, I'd like to see them not as constraints, but really as element of the, of the solution. And in fact, I see that a lot of the details of the biology are lining up in a way that supports a view that neurons are representing uh, the, the error of the representations. And this, the talk is structured uh, this way, where I basically address different problems of that big special credit assignment problem. Um, I'll talk about the very popular weight transport problem at the end, but before I'll, I'll talk about the other problem, which is the problem of having phases in an algorithm uh, and the problem of, of matching with synaptic plasticity rules as observed in slice experiments. So that's gonna be the starting point. And from this, I'm gonna add details in, the bio, in my realistic um, biological neural network and show you that these adding those details in are able to allow neurons to do sophisticated type of credit design. So before I really begin, um, this is this work was done with the Alexandre Payard, a postdoc in my lab, Jordan Gilkev, a PhD student in Blake's lab, and Blake and Peterman. Uh, as a, as a big team, it was a very exciting project. Um, and this idea comes from, or it was published before by Conrad Kurting in a visionary paper in 2001, and has been followed up by uh, Gorkiev and Richards 
uh, recently. And we take these ideas a bit further, uh, as you will see. So to start with, we have to start with the phenomenology of synaptic plasticity as seen in slices. So slice work has shown that the connection between a presynaptic and a postsynaptic neuron will change as a function of the relative timing between a spike in presynaptic and, say, a burst in postsynaptic, such that if you have an a causal relationship post before pre, you'd get LTD, depression, and if you have the other way around, is LTP. The other one is neuromodulation. Um, Neuromodulation, as you change the cocktail of neuromodulator, acetylcholine, serotonin, um, you will change, no matter what type of timing you'll have, the, the connection from LTP to LTD. Um, and so you can go from LTT, LTB, T, sorry, LTP to LTD by changing the cocktail of neuromodulators. But there's another element, another parameter to the plasticity that is not so often discussed and is really the firing pattern of the postsynaptic neuron. So if you pair a presynaptic spike with a postsynaptic spike, you get LTD. And if you pair it with a, a burst, you get LTP. So you can switch from one to the other by changing how bursty the neurons are. And I'm going to come back to that idea, and this is really central to everything I'm going to show you today. So first, to talk about this, I need to come up with a vocabulary. So I set up that vocabulary. If you talk about the firing patterns, I'll set up that vocabulary where I say that an isolated spike is going to be a singlet. And a burst of action potential, say, uh, one, uh, two or th more action potential coming within 15 milliseconds of one another is called a burst. And both of these are events. So an event can be either a singlet or a burst. Okay, so that's my vocabulary. You'll see why I, I chose that particular vocabulary later. Um, so if you, we create a model of the synaptic plasticity, um, you, we would have something like when we pair an event with a singlet, we'd get LTD as shown in this Letzkus experiment here in 2006, but it's been reproduced in many systems. Um, and if we pair an event, whether a single spike or a burst, with a burst postsynaptically, we get LTP. Uh, a little jump in, LT, in, in the weights uh, that will accumulate over multiple such pairings. Now, in order to try to understand what this sort of synaptic plasticity rule does at the more coarse grain level of rates, we need to talk about rates. And firing rates are a really bad way to, to treat this because they completely ignore the principle of changing the firing patterns of the postsynaptic cell. For instance, here, this, if I have one up for the firing rate, this is four hertz, say. Uh, there's four spikes here, but there are four isolated spikes. There are four singlets. And here, there's a burst and an isolated spike. So dramatically different firing patterns, but the same firing rate. So I really need something with two knobs. Uh, so my knobs are going to be the event rate, so the relative number of events. Uh, so these, well, I'll come back to, uh, I'll explain how I generate those later. Um, and the burst probability, such that here you have uh, two events and half burst probability, and here I have four events and zero burst probability. The reason why I choose this burst probability is that, as you'll see later, it's independent of the event rate. Uh, now I can study the effect of that rule on that rate view. And I put my, my synaptic learning rule um, in, uh, in between two neurons, where the two neurons are basically emitting events randomly, they're Poisson event generation, whose event rate I will control, and the post or the, well, the post-synaptic side will in determine whether an event is a burst or a singlet 
according to a predefined burst probability that I control. And if I do long simulations of this plasticity rule and I plot the, the change in weights as a function of the burst probability that I control for a given set of event rate pre and post, you see that, oops, sorry, you see that when there's just a few bursts, we're dominated by LTD, which is we're dominated by this sort of situation. Whereas there's a lot of bursts, we're dominated by LTP, which is this sort of pair. And there's a sweet spot when there's just as much of these two pairings, such that they cancel out on average, and there's no net change in plasticity. This is really nice because we have a parameter that's independent of the event rate that I can use to steer plasticity from LTP to LTD and its relative magnitude. Changing the event rate, as you see in the gray one here, um, does not change the point where this, the, the, the switching point from LTP to LTP. It only changes the magnitude, such that the learning rule looks a bit like this. We have a pre and post event rates that is like a heavy factor that, gener that, that tells you how much potentiation there will be, but not the sign of the potentiation. And the burst probability will, is allowing you to switch from LTP to LTD. So really control the direction of that plasticity. Uh, now, before going further, there's an additional and fairly important element that we add to this learning rule, and it's that of the kind of saturation in the system. Uh, so when there were a lot of bursts in the past, the weight change uh, for a pairing between an event and a burst is going to be a bit smaller. There's tons of processes in, in the biology that are giving rise to this, but it's not a very well-studied phenomenon. Um, but this, this uh, sort of memory uh, allows us to, to, to do the credit assignment later on. So the learning rule actually looks more like this, where if I start at a certain burst probability and I increase the burst probability and I go to, say, 30% in my postsynaptic cell, then I will generate a net positive change in synaptic weights. But as time goes, my, this uh, change in weight will go down, which effectively is redu it's changing the, the set point where the balance between burst and single spikes is happening, such that this set point ends up going down here. And this is our new set point and there's no more changes in the weights. So weights are not keep being increasing forever. Uh, they will they'll balance out because what is driving the plasticity is the difference between the instantaneous burst probability and a moving average of the burst probability of the past. In our simulation, we typically use uh, anything between 2 and 20 seconds, really. It, it, nothing of what I will say will, will be affected by whether you choose 2 seconds or 20 seconds, or even half a second for that matter. So to illustrate that rule, uh, here's a simulation where I have a pre-synaptic ensemble whose event rate is constant in time and burst probability is constant in time. I won't talk about this very much. This is its net uh, synaptic weights. And this is the burst probability that I control. And I increase it here and decrease it there. And what you see is that following an increase, the weight is is going up until the moving threshold of the past activity, notice the time scale here, is such that it, the, the set point is catching up and there's no more plasticity as you see here. And as you release, you can go down. And as you bring the burst probability down again, you can control the weight here. So really this burst probability acts like a controller of the synaptic plasticity here. This is super convenient. It would match really well with a representation of error uh, within certain uh, an ensemble of cells. But what's controlling the burst probability? Well, one 
example that I like to think of, it's not the only one, but it's very convenient, it's very well placed in the, in, in the biology, um, is that of dendrite dependent bursting. So there's this famous experiment by Matthew Larkum where he forced a single spike in the soma. So this year, I would call that as an, I call that an event. It's a single spike, uh, but depending on what he injects in the dendrite, he can turn the single spike into a burst. It remains an event, but the, whether it's a single spike or a burst depends on what happens at the dendrite. Here, the dendritic input is mismatched in time and the single, the, single spike remains a single spike. But if he moves the, the dendritic input, the back propagating action potential is coinciding in a nice way with the dendritic input, and that generates a big calcium spike, which forwards propagate and generates this burst. So what we have is something where, um, depending on the dendritic input, I can control the burstiness of the neuron, no matter what the event rate really is. So it's a picture like this that I've uh, alluded to before. Where I really have two knobs. One is the inputs into the proximal dendrites. It's going to control the, the net number of events that are happening. And another input onto the apical dendrites up in layer one, which will control the burst probability, determining whether an event is a burst or a single spike um, on average in this ensemble. So in fact, in the simulation that I had shown you with my plasticity rule here, the way I was controlling the burst probability was not artificial. I had two compartment neurons here where what I was injecting is at this point, a sudden increase in the frequency of inputs onto the distal dendrites, which increased the burst probability and led to an increase in weight of the synapses down here in the proximal dendrites. Same here, when I suddenly decrease the rate of the distal inputs, this decreases the burst probability of this pink ensemble, or this pink cell here, this is actually just a single cell, decreases the weight here in the proximal dendrite. Uh, and all this is independent of whether these guys are, are having a change in burst probability. As you can see here, here I've suddenly increased the input to the distal dendrite that increased the burst probability presynaptically, but there was no associated change in the weights of those synapses. And another element of the biology that fits really well with this uh, is in this recent paper on bioarchive by Guy Doron and, Matthew, and uh, Jiun Shin in the group of Matthew Larkum, for which I was actually also involved in. Um, in that paper, they show that despite the fact that feedback's been involved in many things, there's a clear role of feedback, particularly onto distal dendrites, in regulating learning. Uh, in that experiment, they trained mice and rats to detect uh, a micro -stimulation, stimulation within S1. So it's an electrical shock that's sent in S1. And they ask the, the rats to, to detect this. And the rats learn this very quickly. It takes one or two days. They become really good. Here is untrained. Here is control, meaning that the, no particular manipulation has been done. And the rats are, within one day, able to, on that learning score, improve very well. So they lick in response to a micro-stimulation. Now, what they've done here is they've blocked the feedback from perirhinal cortex onto the layer one of S1 here. Uh, perirhinal cortex is situated really at the top of the sensory hierarchy, close to the hippocampal formation, well, in the hippocampal, in the hippocampal formation, I think, uh, where uh, multiple sensory modalities are, are, are converging. So that will be a nice place from which to start to do sort of supervised learning from other modalities onto, say, S1. Um, and when they block that specific pathway, so it's just one pathway within the whole cortex, they affect learning dramatically. So this here is a dread experiment, and, and really the animals are not able to learn to detect that, that task. And it's not about the perception, because 
if they wait for the animals to be expert at detecting this microstimulation and then they block the pathway, there's no change in the performance of the animal. So all this goes to say that there's pretty strong evidence that feedback, particularly into layer one and the epical dendrites of neurons, is involved in uh, regulating learning. And in that paper, they also show that bursting of those cells is associated with this feedback. Um, so that is that means that I can put a controlling of these synapses away from these neurons to whatever is controlling the inputs onto the apical dendrite. Uh, cool, right? But there's a problem with this. If we were to do real credit assignment, we'd need to have different sort, sort of information going in different uh, direction within the network. Particularly if the sensory information going up the hierarchy from a given neuron within the hierarchy, uh, and it, this neuron also receives a credit a, a signal saying how good its representation of the sensory information is. Then at the same time, if this, this neuron received information from somewhere else, it should send back with a feedback signal another type of information that is another type of inherited credit for this neuron. So, and this credit that this neuron should receive should be proportional to the sensory information it's coding and the inherited credit it's got. So it's some type of multiplication between the sensory code and the inherited credit you received there. But the main thing is that these two things are fundamentally different types of information. So are neurons able to do that? That's another very important problem in doing credit assignment, and it's solved in machine learning by having phases. Um, but the, the, the neurons, I think, are doing something different. Uh, so this is the second part of the talk where I talk about uh, getting rid of those phases because it's not, it doesn't really make sense for neurons to have phases. It would require neurons to suddenly be completely um, closed from any type of sensory information for what could be quite a long time um, if we were to follow the type of phase learning that's done in machine learning. So uh, there's multiple types of multiplexing and Although in machine learning, you do that sort of time division multiplexing where you go from phase one, phase two, phase one, phase two in order to do these different types of uh, message passing. And there's also the frequency division of multiplexing that's done in, in radios and where you have amplitude modulation of different frequencies are combined and then demultiplexed. Neurons seem to be able to do a, yet another type of multiplexing that is specific to spiking neurons. I find it fascinating. And to me, it could be one reason why you have spikes still in the cortex. Um, so to explain this, this is a summary of our PNES paper in 2018 with Henning Spreckler. You consider an ensemble firing rate code, this sort of fast representation of a time-dependent signal. That is, uh, here you have an ensemble of cells with responses in time. The ensemble rate means that you calculate the number of spikes uh, within each time bit. Sorry about that. And such that the ensemble rate evolution in time represent the input evolution in time. Another way to look at this is to separate multiple types of spike time patterns uh, in order to represent multiple streams of information. So we can imagine that an ensemble of cells receives multiple streams of inputs and that we want to recover those streams of input by looking at different spike time patterns. Here, events are denoted in blue and bursts are orange dots. Here, there's one event, even though there's three spikes, there's one event and one burst. Here in that time bin, there's two events and one burst. Here in that time, then there's three events in one burst. So the event rate, the ensemble event rate is increasing in time, but the burst probability is decreasing in time. So these can be completely independent signals. 
and you can represent them fast in the limit of large ensembles. You can double the amount of information being represented in neurons. Um, and the nice thing is that neurons can communicate uh, these two channels of information by properties of, of synapses. Short-term plasticity <clears throat> allows you to communicate those two streams of information. Here's a, an experimental representation of short-term facilitation in cortical neurons, where the burst of presynaptic spikes is leading to a gradual increase of the postsynaptic potential. Uh, I see this as filtering for bursts. If you have a singlet, you have almost no response postsynaptically. If you have a burst, you, get, you do get a response. The same axon can also, into a different target, give rise to short-term depression. Here's a potent short-term depression shown in, in, an, in a cortical neuron again. Uh, and here, a burst has a strong first EPSP, but the later EPSP are almost negligibly small. Uh, so I see this as filtering for events. So no matter whether you have a singlet or a burst, you roughly um, communicate the same thing. And that's really where my vocabulary comes from. So this can be used for multiplexing. Here I, I put all this in sure, front of you. A quick question there. Yeah. yeah. A couple of your audience have uh, had, had a question actually because the connection was a bit bad. So uh, oh. somebody asked whether um, whether it's important that the presynaptic spikes are actually just spikes or like the presynaptic events are singlets. Whether presynaptic events are singlets or just, so it, 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 as, it doesn't have to be singlet. It can, in, in the network, in the whole network, you'll see that I, I move away from that two ensemble picture. Now we'll let the presynaptic ensemble have events that are either singlets or bursts. I think that answer the question. Yeah, I think that answers it. Thanks. Thanks. That's it? Okay. Yep, that's it. Just uh, keep it slow because I think the connection is a little bit spotty. Um, okay. We're doing okay, well. thank Thanks. you. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll slow down then. Sorry about that. So here's a simulation of two ensembles. Uh, and I inject a time-dependent input in this lower ensemble. It's communicating here with short-term depression to a higher ensemble. This lower ensemble event uh, input is shown here. The event rate matches a time-dependent input. And if I look at the event rate and the input are both matching for this pink ensemble, that's normal. You, you'd have exactly the same thing with firing rate. But the difference here is that these simulations were not done exactly like this. This is not the whole picture. I didn't tell you that in these same simulations, I had a time-dependent input injected in the apical dendrites of those neurons that was modulating in time the burst probability of that ensemble. You don't see any effect of this modulation of burst probability on the event rate, although you would see a huge modulation on the firing rate. And now I've used this short-term facilitation onto synapses here, which means that it should filter for bursts, multiplication between those two. So, the first straight of that pink ensemble is flooded here in dash orange. And so if I'm um, doing things right, I should be able to represent that burst straight in the burst probability of that green ensemble. And this is what I show here, the red line is the burst probability of that green ensemble. And it's not affecting the event rate representation. So I have in this green ensemble, a representation of both this feed forward signal and the feedback signal when scaled here with the feed forward signal. So let me say that again. What happened here is that I have input onto the lower ensemble that gives a lower, a change in lower ensemble feed forward rate, which communicated with short term depression 
gives rise to a change in the higher ensemble feed forward, uh, feed forward rate. Um, and this is then combined by the signal that's inherited from above, that could be the credit, that multiplies this and gives a burst rate of the higher ensemble, uh, the multiplication between what could be sensory representation and inherited credit that gives rise to something that could be unit specific credit that is then allowed to to back propagate to that lower ensemble and modulate the burst probability and therefore possibly its own synaptic inputs so you see that we kind of have all the elements to do what the back propagation of error is doing and it's all lining up really well if we allow this sort of short-term depression to the to the feed forward connection and short-term facilitation to the feedback connection which by the way would be the one central prediction of our work this has not been observed it hasn't been looked at whether the feedback connection received are sending mostly short-term facilitation onto apical dendrites So we've tested this in a, in, a, in a larger network to see whether we can do so, the credit assignment. So we're just here did XOR, where we have a hidden layer, input units, and an output layer. The input units receive low, high, low, high, or low, low, high, high activity in time. And we'll want to train the network to respond only for when either of the two input ensemble is firing high, so in the middle here. Um, and we'll do this not by change, controlling those weights directly, but only by changing the inputs onto those apical dendrites at the output. That's all we're going to do. We're going to look at what's the response of this cell. If So before learning here, we have this dash line. Um, so before learning, we see that there's not high response at any point. So we'll want to have a high response when in the middle here. So whenever I have this, I give a dendritic input that's positive, which will increase the burst probability and then back propagating with short facilitate, short term facilitate, facilitating synapses onto the hidden unit ensemble and control those synapses that are multiple synapses away from our controller, really. And if we do this time and time again, we get the after learning curve here. This is the event rate of the pink ensemble. You see that it learned to fire strongly only when either of the two inputs are, are high at the same time. And this is done only through this sort of dendritic input and burst probability of the pink ensemble. Uh, you can test that this is really dependent on the plasticity of those synapses by locking the plasticity of those synapses onto hidden units, as seen in the orange line here. This is the cost function as a function of training epoch. And you see that we surely do not follow the, the sort of learning curves that are seen normally in the figure I've just shown you in blue. Um, and here is the response event rate for uh, uh, orange here the, the, when we lock those spikes. We've chosen here each hidden ensemble has, was uh, 500 neurons, but we could reduce the number of neurons. Uh, it's just slowing down the learning. As you can see here in green is when we go from 500 to 400 neurons. It's, it, it learns, but more slowly. And we can, this is, this learning is robust to randomly make a randomization of, of the ordering of the examples. And it's also robust whether we make some type of predefined pattern of connection in the feedback or we just let one hidden ensemble have random feedback. So all this together, I'd say that the, this burst dependent learning rule when paired with the, the apical dendrite-dependent bursting and the sort of short-term facilitating connectivity, 
uh, allows you to do credit assignment uh, in spiking neural network in a biologically realistic way. Now, to scale up things, and the last thing I want to say is to is the idea of alignment and uh, linearization, linearity of the feedback. So we coarse grain our, our approach. We go from spiking to rate models. And we have a rate model equivalent of my learning rule uh, that looks like this. Event rate pre and post and the nonlinear readout of the feedback onto the apical dendrites. And this is why is the matrix on the feedback. Uh, so this is a three, in neuroscience, we call this a three-factor learning rule. There's a Hebbian factor. There's a sign third factor. But it corresponds to machine learning where you have a unit-specific credit, that's the three factors, and the inherited credit that is uh, controlling the sign of the plasticity here. And he would have a derivative of the activation function, which would match with, say, which, with units that would have, say, here, an exponential activation function although we could clearly replace this by ReLU or other type of activation function, which would change the form of a plasticity rule, uh, but would not introduce anything that's not biologically realistic. So there are two differences with real backpropagation of error. One is linearity. Here in, the, in our burst prop learning rule, it's a nonlinear propagation of error. Uh, we can mend this by taking into account the fact that these neurons are integrated in uh, an inhibitory microcircuit that can linearize the relationship between dendritic input and burst probability, such that here, for instance, changing the weights of the dendrite targeting interneurons will change the linear, how linear is this relationship? You can do the same for different features, such as VIP uh, cell activity or other weights or other parts of or other elements of the circuit search test, detritic excitability. So in our rate-based network, we have a mechanism that preserves that the network in the linear regime here. Um, and with this, we're able to learn pretty well. Now, the other element is reciprocity. The feedback, this weight transport problem, it's very famous. Uh, and Typical solution to this is uh, feedback alignment, where we just fix the, um, the feedback weight and let the feed forward weights align to this. Well, we tested this in CIFAR and ImageNet, and uh, here is backprop uh, performance. Here is node perturbation, which is what you would get for reward-based uh, control of the, of the synapses. And here is when you do feedback alignment in our, in our network. Um, using the burst prop learning rule. Uh, it, it just doesn't learn as much, and this is something we know already from Akrut et al., uh, 2019, but Akrut has also can't come up with a way to solve this, which is to learn, the introduce learning onto the feedback connections. And they do that by using an explicit representation of the gradient. But since we also have an explicit representation of the gradient, we can copy that rule in our network, in term, and it becomes a rule as a function of event rate and burst probability. Um, that's slightly different. I can go into the details, but it's slightly different. It's not exactly the same, which matches with what has been seen in real neurons. The, the learning rule onto the apical dendrite doesn't seem to be the same as the learning rule onto the uh, proximal dendrite. And when we do this, we're able to learn, this is the red curve here, is our burst prop learning for CIFAR, which matches really burst prop. And here is the learning rule for uh, burst prop, which is short of uh, the back propagation of error, but we, I should note that we were not able to linearize our feedback in the convolutional la layer for um, technical reasons. So all this together, and the take home for, from this talk is that where the sort of relative timing of synaptic plasticity might be involved in Hebbian unsupervised learning, and the neural modulation might be involved in reward-modulated, reinforced type of learning. I'd like to argue that the dependency on post-synaptic firing patterns allows you to do an 
unsupervised type of learning. And media allows you to see neurons as being able to represent an error on, of, their represent, of their own representation. Um, and so with this, I welcome any question and first, and also thank uh, all the members that are, have participated to this work. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, sorry about the, the connection problems. Sometimes it happens, but I think in the end, probably people understood you well. At least there are some questions here. Um, um, so I'm going to try to get some people on stage, actually. And we'll see whether they accept. Um, I'm just going to get multiple people, and then we go in the in the order. So I don't I don't know. Do you see the chat window? Because you're getting a lot of applause here at the moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, sorry about the connection problem too. I've had some right. party issues. Yeah, no worries. Um, that's, that's why. I, that, like with talking slower, I think it was not a problem. Okay, so so I'm gonna I'm just gonna start asking. Um, or more. So, bursting neurons are often attributed to layer five, which have the dendrites in layer one. How would this burst dependent plasticity map to other cortical layers? How would it affect the plasticity in other layers as they are recurrently, um, indirectly, or directly connected? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Um, and it is probably the most important limitation of the work I've presented today because all of this is really, in terms of the details, uh, targeted to the layer 5B pyramidal cells. Um, and although there's, I mean, these are really important cells, uh, and they're numerous in the brain, we would, we would have to do proper accredited assignment. We shouldn't leave like all the other neurons to do <laughs> whatever. Um, so, I don't know how other neurons would be able to do this, but I don't think that it's impossible for them to do some version of this. Uh, for instance, like layer two tree pyramidal cells do not, do not have full-fledged calcium uh, spikes in the dendrites, but there's something there. So is this little something enough to change the firing pattern in a more subtle way that doesn't lead to those really starkly bursting phenotype, but can still be used to do the same idea. In fact, with um, a master student in my bag, uh, Zeke, we asked the question, how how much do you need those bursts to be really like uh, obviously bursts? Can you have just a smooth transi transition with a firing rate that's high and a firing rate that's slightly lower? and make a category like this and still multiplex. His conclusion is that yes. So you don't need like bimodal into spike interval to really give rise to the sort of multiplexing that I've been talking about. Uh, the system is able to work with, although it's making a bit, a, a few mistakes in, in, in its communications, it's able to work really well with that sort of uh, more fuzzy uh, setup. So it's, it would be a very interesting um, area of further research. For the question. Okay, very well. Um, so then, here's another question. So in the in the paper, a single ensemble uh, require two thousand pyramidal neurons, and you require five ensembles to solve X or. Why do you think this much of neurons or this many neurons are required to solve a simple task? Yeah. So the whole thing would work with like one neuron per ensemble, um, it would just be extremely slow. So here, in a concern of being realistic, my view, neurons do not wait like two seconds to have a, an accurate estimate of their firing rate every layer. Uh, so in order to communicate a message quickly, they do ensemble coding. So that allows them to, to represent an ensemble rate within 10, five milliseconds instead of like a few seconds. Um, so 
here the number is just there as a trade-off for speed of communication. Um, and in the simulation I've showed today, we I showed I used 500 neurons per ensemble. Uh, we could go down and still have a fairly good speed in terms of propagation. Uh, and another aspect is that we are just using a very simplified population code here. There's no distribution of the coding, such as such as is known to be happening in cortex. So all these together, I think, will allow neurons to represent information fast uh, and fairly efficiently with, with spiking neurons. Cool, thanks. Nas has a question for you now. Thanks, Dr. Nath, that was uh, really exciting stuff. Um, the question that I have is about the fact that uh, in the introduction, you created this split between bursting behavior and singlet behavior. And of course, how we draw that boundary, what we do classify as a burst is kind of up to the modeler. Um, but it strikes me that this is, and maybe you agree, maybe you want, but maybe th th this seems to be just a separation into a high frequency and a low frequency kind of filtered version of the neural activity and kind of collecting rates on these to do stuff. Um, and then I guess the question is, if we can do this in this kind of in this bimodal way, do you think there's a place for multiple modes of communication? So essentially what we're saying is neurons can then you know, transfer two types of information within their activity. And can we split up the space into more frequency bands, say? Do you think there's any role there, possibility? Absolutely. And in fact, when I first thought of first ensemble multiplexing, I didn't, I didn't see this as being restricted to the idea of bursts and communicating only two signals. You could communicate many signals in principle. Uh, you could, like theoretically, you could think of patterns such as like bursts, uh, silence, and silence bursts. You know, that's another pattern whose ensemble rate could communicate yet something else, right? So the, you could, in principle, communicate a lot of information this way. However, I'm, I, in my concern of understanding the brain here, I'm not sure if the, there exists a way of, of doing that demultiplexing with synapses. There's, there's quite a lot of fancy thing being done by synapses in short-term plasticity. Uh, if you look particularly onto the, the mossy fiber synapse, you can, there are fancy things happening there. So there's place for a third signal for sure. Um, but more than that, I doubt so. Okay, that's really cool because it also speaks to the fact that maybe, you know, you talked about patterns of spikes and timing of spikes would be a really cool way to leverage, again, the spiking property of neurons. So thanks. Thanks a lot for the question. Um, okay, so I, I had another question. So is it actually perhaps the only putative credit assignment scheme with a biological plausible mechanism that uses the same neurons to communicate two different messages? Well, I, I yeah, I mean, how, it, it, of course, one well, we might have a, a discussion of what biological plausibility is. Um, there's, of course, the, the work of um, of uh, Sacramento, which I haven't uh, uh, cited in that paper, but it's highly relevant here, and it's fairly similar. Mm. Uh, they don't have the okay, same type working. of uh, connection with the synaptic plasticity rule, uh, but there's certainly an online approach there um, that, that would work. Uh, other than that, in my view, it's mostly phase space, which we could argue, but I don't think it's biologically relevant. Okay. Okay, so next question was by Paul, who just apparently disappeared again. Um, although we heard him for a moment, also connection troubles. Well, then uh, maybe we can do a quick one. Um, how does short-term facilitation and short-term depression compared to recurrent inhibitory dynamics and feed-forward inhibition and excitation observed in the neocortex? And there's a bit too many ants for me to completely parse that sentence. There's a lot of ants. I think the question is, um, the question is basically, could you get a similar effect with detecting the bursts uh, with excitation inhibition. That's what I'm parsing. 
I'm not sure that's what the question is, but it's an interesting question, at least according to me. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, uh, well, yeah, I, I don't What I would say to this is that um, I have ignored here any type of recurrence, uh, whether it's within within layer or from a layer to another lower. Um, and real, real cortex has recurrent connections. And in fact, you can even find some short-term facilitation, although I think it's mostly short-term depressing within uh, a column. Uh, you can find short-term facilitation and you can even find connections that are within the circuit, local circuit going up to the apical dendrite. So the biology is much more messy than we think. Uh, and, and also, obviously, there's, there's a relationship with the feed forward and feedback inhibition. In my view, this is, this is sticking the, the, the picture I've shown here, where when you have a primal cell going to PV positive cells, it will send depressing or non short-term plasticity uh, connections. And the feedback is also without short-term plasticity. Uh, or just depressing. So that, that will keep like event rate within that PV system being event rate. And then when you send to some other statin positive cell, then you connect to the to then then right. So that fits with that uh, credit system. Um, but uh, altogether, the, clearly the biology is more complex and there are multiple things happening at the same time. And it's not just this sort of supervised credit assignment. And what I haven't treated here is unsupervised learning. I mean, I hope that unsupervised learning is, is, is using that sort of representation of error, but I don't know how. Uh, so it'd be really interesting to know you can map uh, an unsupervised learning algorithm onto that sort of cortical blueprint. Yeah, that'd be cool. All right, thank you. This last question is please only a very short answer with yes or no, ideally. Uh, and that's Paul's question. Can you do credit assignment through more than one hidden layer? Oh, um, I haven't done that, uh, but I'm sure I can. So let's see. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, we're a little bit over time, so I'll cut the questions here. And uh, I would like to thank Nisha again for this uh, beautiful talk. Thanks for the good questions from the audience. And yeah, we're going to move on to the next. And step. you can ask me on Twitter if you if you want further questions. I'm glad to answer. Perfect. So I hope everybody um, has Rishas Twitter. Otherwise, you could write it in the chat here, and then everybody knows how to yeah, find it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for the questions. Thanks, Rishas, again. Thank you, Friedman. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>